got some people coming through the foyer, and uh, we're going to get going. Uh, I'm going to start off with a couple of announcements, and the people still coming in. Steve's going to Steve's going to take over for me here on the announcements right here in a second. But uh, I want to start out this morning. Uh, just go ahead and address something that this church has dealt with this week. Um, Randy and Patty Ames always sit right back here. And uh, they've been coming to this church for a while. And uh, we lost Randy Monday night. And Monday night, Randy passed away. You'll remember Randy. Randy was the one. Uh, Randy's a poet. He uh, wrote his own music. He was the one that sang the special music on, uh, on uh, Sunday after Valentine's Day, the, the music that he had written for his wife. He shared that with us as a special. So you can go on the website, youcreekbaptchurch.org, and you can find the Sunday directly after Easter, and you can still uh, look that up and you can still listen to it. Uh, quite a talented per person, a uh, concert pianist, and uh, we just loved him. They are part, really a part of us. One thing about this church, Be Creek Baptist Church, is they just love on each other. And, uh, but we lost him on Monday, and uh, his uh, celebration of life service will be April the 6th. That's this coming Saturday at 11 a.m., and anyone uh, here is invited to come to that service Saturday afternoon or Saturday morning at 11, and uh, it's a potluck. Just bring a, a fruit or a fruit or salads, either one, to go along with the main course. So. Uh, you're invited to that, and uh, that's that's when we will celebrate his life. And uh, I'm going to get Steve to come up and see him. We, uh, yeah, I'm just really burdened this morning that, uh, to share. Uh, we lost Randy on Monday, and we lost Vale Wongsdorf on Friday. Uh, Vale was in a truck accident, and we lost him on Friday. Um, and thinking through this, um, yeah, I do have a praise. I got a big praise in my heart. And both of those guys were in the service last week. They were in the service last week celebrating Jesus. And is that, isn't that what we're here for? Yeah. You know, today is Easter Sunday, and he's risen, and we're here to celebrate him. We're not here to, to cry and to be sad, we're here to celebrate what God has for us to go to. And God, you know, we lose them, but God takes them in. And uh, so I'm going to let Steve take over right here and try to get out of the way. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Happy Resurrection Day. Yeah. Yeah, Jesus is alive. Isn't that great? Awesome. Hey, listen, we'd like to invite you um, this uh, Wednesday evening. We're going to have Bible study, uh, potluck at 6, Bible study at 645. We're going to have an Italian theme on the uh, potluck, and I'll try to bring the Bible study in Italian, too. <laughs> Be a very short Bible study. Just uh, we want to invite you to the women's Bible study, and it is April 6th and 20th at 10 a.m., and that is in the fellowship room over here. Yes. That will be canceled because of the memorial. Oh, okay. So not this April, not this Saturday. Not the 6th, but the next Saturday. Okay, so it's going to be the 20th then on the Women's Bible Study. Men's Bible Study, Book of James, Tuesday mornings at 10. Pastor P.K. teaches that, and that's... Uh, that's one, one to go to. The book of James is so interesting. Oh, my goodness. Um, if you have any prayer requests, you can call uh, uh, the number in your bulletin. Let's see what else we got. We want to thank Heaven Sent Flowers for our flowers here. It's just awesome. And thank you guys all for coming to church. You know, it's... Uh, some of you we see regularly, and some of you we don't, but we're glad to see you. How's that sound? <laughs> I'm going to ask everybody to stand together and bow your heads. Uh, we're going to open the prayer here. Lord God, thank you so much for what you've done for us. Lord, we invite you here to be with us and anoint us all. Lord, we thank you for dying on the cross and loving us and taking care of us.
thank you for just being our God and Savior in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Look in your uh, bulletin, you'll see course to He Paid Debt. We're going to kick it off this morning in music with He Paid Debt. Words are in your bulletin.
sit right behind the roof for song, but they're going to come up here and sing.
Let's continue to praise this morning. Uh, uh, look in your, look in your hymnal 343. We're singing some oldies this morning. 343, just some that are, they'll really come to you. Uh, just an opportunity to praise and just lift up the Lord. 343 in your hymnal, Amazing Grace. ascension into heaven which gives us a picture of what's going to happen and your intercession for us and for all who call on your name we just want to glorify you we want you to be pleased with what you hear and what you see we want to worship you today in spirit and truth for we give you this in Jesus name Amen, Amen. <laughs> Yeah. 
It's been hard. You ready to get out to your veil? Yes. But I know he's with his daddy, his favorite brother, and his mama. And I know he's happy and doesn't hurt anymore. Mm -hmm. So I need to be happy for him. I'm just a crybaby. <laughs> I cry at everything. So do we. But I thank you, all of you. I thank you for giving me the opportunity to pray for others. I feel God telling me that I need to pray for others. Lay hands on them, pray for them. So if any of you have any problem, physically, mentally, spiritually, and you struggle with it, I just want you to know I'm here and I'm available. Thank you. Amen. So I will do that anytime. I feel very blessed. That early part was the young people. This is the old people. <laughs> <laughs> and when she said we're going to sing, I said, because she told, said the Lord told her to. So I was like, oh, okay. Yeah. <laughs> some, you know, some Wednesday night or something, you know. And, uh, and then it wasn't until a week later she said, that was Easter. Uh, you know. Anyway, so you're all going to know these choruses, so jump in. They're just choruses mm -hmm. that praise the name.
understanding and knowledge as we study your word. Lord, help us to motivate us just to pray, to learn about you, to worship you in spirit and truth, to look forward to your coming, and to run the race and finish it while we're here on the face of this earth. And Lord, we promise to give you all the glory. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Hey, listen, if you've got a cell phone, would you mind turning it off or turning it on silent? Because um, otherwise I'll keep you here till 3 o'clock. <laughs> you know, we don't think of God as having problems, do we? You know, we think of God just being perfect and, and never, never having any problem. But God has a couple of problems that he had to deal with. The first problem is when the great and powerful cherub named Lucifer decided to rebel against God. He decided he wanted to be his own God, do his own thing. And God had to put that rebellion down. Lucifer became the Satan, the destroyer. And God had another problem. He created mankind, human beings in Adam and in Eve. And he gave them one prohibition. You can, you can enjoy paradise, you can do anything you want, you can name the animals, you can, you can just enjoy uh, the, the perfectness of environment. One prohibition, just don't do this one thing. Now you and I would think, okay, that can't be that hard, huh? But unfortunately, Adam did sin, and he ate of the fruit that he was told not to eat. At that point in time, at that exact point in time, Adam and Eve, when they ate and disobeyed God, they lost their spirit. They were created spiritually alive, what we call a trichotomy. They had a body, physical body, they had a mind, a soul, and a spirit, okay? So when Adam and Eve sinned, that communication line was cut off, and they became a dichotomous being. They became only body and soul. The spirit is what we communicate with God through. That's why it is said that they became spiritually dead, all right? That's what spiritual death means. Unfortunately, that wasn't the end of it because, because of Adam and the DNA that sin produced in him, every single person ever born from that point on time would inherit a sin nature. We're born with a sin nature. You first realize that around two years old, when the first word that a baby learns is no. no. <laughs> right? They call the terrible twos. I don't know what the fours are called, but they got to be bad too. So here is God, and he had a problem. He had a problem is this creation that he loved and that he wanted to inherit his kingdom, that he wanted to share his paradise, his eternal life with, 
now is soiled and his integrity cannot bring mankind in fellowship with him any longer unless something happens. It's interesting because Genesis 3 records the sin of Adam and Eve for us. And in Genesis 3.15, God provides a salvation message. He says, I'm going to provide a savior for you. The seed of the woman. And the seed of the woman will destroy the seed of the evil one. So, God took care of the sin nature. In that, at that point in time, before Jesus came, everybody looked forward to the Savior. All right? When Jesus was here on the face of the earth, they had the opportunity to believe in him at that point in time in the present tense. Now we have the luxury of hindsight 2020, of looking back at the life, the birth, the life, the, the death of Jesus Christ, his resurrection and ascension, and now his ministry of interceding for us and for anyone that calls on his name. God provided a, a, a remedy. And the remedy God provided was this, is that God took his word. God is also a trichotomous being. He has a spirit, he has his word, and he is God. God, we call it the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And God sacrificed himself in his word, and his word became a human being, it says in John chapter 1, verse 14. God actually demoted himself, if you will, to becoming a human being. Why? It took a perfect human being to create sin. And it would take a perfect human being to solve the sin problem. Jesus Christ was born as the God-man. Perfectly God and perfectly man. He is the only person in the universe like himself. Just as God is unique, Jesus Christ is unique. There is none like him. And so Jesus Christ grew up as a boy and without any sin, he was born without sin. You see, sin comes through the father, not through the mother. That's what the Bible says. And since God was Jesus Christ's father, he did not inherit that sin nature that you and I have. So he was qualified at that point because he didn't have any sin in him. Now the secret is, can you live life without sinning? And that was undoubtedly very hard. I mean, it would be, you know, look at us. We can barely live for 30 minutes without committing some kind of a sin or some kind of a bad thought or something. So Jesus Christ grows up as a young boy, a toddler, and becomes, you know, a, 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 a teenager at some point. In fact, the Bible tells us at his age 12, when his mother and father took him to the temple on the feast day, that they, they lost track of him. And they, they headed back home and found out that he wasn't with them. And when they went back, they found this 12-year-old boy named Jesus talking and interacting with the religious leaders of the day. You see, his parents had taught him the Old Testament, the Word of God, the prophets, the Psalms, the Proverbs. So Jesus Christ was well aware of what the Old Testament says. The name Jesus means God saves, and Christ means the Anointed One. So Jesus Christ is the Anointed One that God saves through. Well, so at age 12, he is at the temple, and he's interacting with these religious leaders. We go on and he grew up in his life as a young man and as a man never committing one sin. Now that's hard to imagine, isn't it? I mean, it's, just, it's, just, it's really impossible for us to imagine not committing one sin. 
Now, there are people in this life that don't think they're sinners. The Bible says that if you don't think you're a sinner, you're deceived. Because you are. Okay? Sorry for the bad news. <laughs> and at age 30, Jesus Christ comes down and he is baptized by John the Baptist, his cousin. He goes into the water. This was not a baptism of repentance. This was a baptism of dedication. Jesus Christ was dedicating himself, his life, to the ministry that God had planned. Listen, and you don't have to turn there, but listen to what Acts chapter 2 and chapter 4 says. Acts 2.22, Peter is speaking. And he's speaking to a large crowd. There was a large crowd during the Passover feast in Jerusalem, not hundreds, but thousands, literally thousands of people. We know that in one session, 3,000 people got saved at one time. That's pretty amazing. Peter says this, he says, men of Israel, listen to this. Jesus of Nazareth was a man accredited by God to you by miracles, wonders, and signs which God did among you through him. As you yourselves know, this man, speaking of Jesus, was handed over to you, listen, by God's set purpose and foreknowledge. God's plan was to hand his son over to be killed. Jesus Christ, in effect, was born to die. Now, he goes on. And you, with the help of wicked men, Speaking of the Romans, the Gentiles. Put him to death by nailing him to the cross, but God raised him from the dead, freeing him from the agony of death, because it was impossible for death to hold him. Listen to what Acts chapter 4 says. This is still Peter. He had just been released from speaking with the religious leaders. They told him, I don't want you speaking in Jesus' name. I don't want you speaking about him anymore. And you know what the first thing he did? He spoke in Jesus' name. Isn't that awesome? <clears throat> he says, Indeed, Herod and Pontius Pilate met together. These were the Roman officials. With the Gentiles and the people of Israel in this city, Jerusalem, to conspire against your holy servant, Jesus, whom you anointed, they did what your power and will had decided beforehand should happen. You know, it was God's plan to rectify man's sin. And how could he do that? Well, he, God, his word became flesh. You see, your word is a part of you. You own your word. That's why it's so important for the right words to come out of your mouth. Because whatever words come out of your mouth is who you are. You own it. And so God provided Jesus Christ. And at his baptism, Jesus came out of the water and he heard a voice from heaven saying, This is my beloved Son in whom I'm well pleased. Wow. Wow. The one thing, the one sentence we all want to hear is this. Enter thou into the joy of the Lord, my good and faithful servant. That's the one word we all want to hear. Well, so Jesus Christ hears this, and you know what the first thing that happens is they throw a party and it's all wonderful and... No, that's not what happened. No. Not what happened. He was led by the Holy Spirit into the wilderness, into a desert, to be tempted for 40 days and 40 nights by the evil one, the one who had rebelled against God, the Satan. And there was a temptation toward his flesh. He had fasted for 40 days and 40 nights and he was hungry. And the devil said, well, look, if you're the son of God, man, just turn these stones into bread. You could probably even add a little butter to it. No, man shall live on the word of God. That will be his bread. Well, the devil took him up to the temple, a high place. He says, throw yourself down. The angels will protect you. You might as well make a grand entrance. 
Everybody will know that you're the Son of God at that point. And Jesus says, no, you, you don't tempt God. You, you don't tempt God. Then he, Satan said to him, listen, all of the world's kingdoms have been given to me. You know who gave it to him? Adam. Adam gave Satan. Handed over the title deed to the earth when he disobeyed God. Satan is called the prince of the power of the air. He said to Jesus, he says, listen, you don't have to go to the cross. You don't have to die. You can become a king right now. I will give you all of the kingdoms of the world. You can become the king. All you have to do is bat on worship me. And Jesus said, no. Uh-uh. No, God is the only one who's worthy of worship. It says Satan left him at that point in time. So at age 30, he's begun his ministry. He's led into the wilderness. He's had these temptations. Do you know that Jesus Christ in those temptations went through every test and every temptation that you and I will ever go through? Ever. It says that he was tempted in every way that we are, yet was without sin. We have a great Savior, my friends. An amazing Savior. The Bible says that when we have a need, in view of His grace, we can, we can come before the throne of grace and we can find help in our time of need. 24 hours a day, 7 days a week, we can come before God if we want to. The question is, do we? Jesus went through the terrain there, the area, the nation, preaching good news, healing the sick, feeding the hungry, raising the dead. And we know that six months before he was to die, he was, well, let me read it to you. It says, as the time approached for him to be taken to heaven. You remember that Jesus always said, my time has not come, right? His time was coming. This is Luke chapter 9, verse 51. As the time approached for him to be taken to heaven, Jesus resolutely set out for Jerusalem, knowing, knowing what was going to happen. He knew that he would be rejected by the people. He would be rejected by the religious leaders. He would be rejected by the government. He knew that he was going to die. He knew that he was going to be tortured. The only thing that Jesus didn't really know is what it was like to be separated from his father. And that was the worst of all of it. When we think about the punishment that Jesus took, and when we think about the physical beatings and everything, those were actually secondary to him being separated from God the Father for those three hours on the cross. Well, let's go on. You know, the apostles, his disciples had no clue. He said to them in Luke chapter 9, he says this. He says, the Son of Man, speaking of himself, must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders, chief priests, and teachers of the law. And he must be killed and on the third day be raised to life. Jesus knew that. And yet, that had to be hard. I mean, that had to be hard. He resolutely... You know, we make New Year's resolutions, and then a month later they're all gone, right? <laughs> you know, it's funny, I weigh the same that I did before New Year's Eve. <laughs> I just don't understand it. But Jesus made a resolution, I'm going to Jerusalem. I'm going to fulfill my mission. I'm going to do my Father's will. Salvation of all mankind depends upon this. I'm going. I'm heading out. And he did. So in Luke 19, 
38, you don't have to, or 28, you don't have to turn there. Jesus rides into Jerusalem on a colt, a donkey. And man, there are people that are just celebrating and calling him the Messiah and calling him, the, they're putting palm branches down before him and they're just, they're just, I mean, saying, hail to the king. And he rides into to Jerusalem and many of those people three days later will be shouting, crucify him. How sad is that? He goes into Jerusalem. He goes into the temple and he finds that it's a commercial operation. They're selling things in the temple. They're asking people for money. You know, Unfortunately, there's a lot of churches that concentrate on people giving money. Listen, God doesn't need your money, okay? He just wants you. He just wants you. Now, if money is a part of that, that's great. If that's a gift that you can give to God, that's wonderful. But we can also give the gift of encouragement, the gift of worship, the gift of... We, I mean, there's a hundred gifts for a hundred people. But Jesus went in there and he really, literally upset the apple carts. And you know what? That didn't go over very big with the, with the religious leaders, did Because they were making Boku bucks off of this. At that point in time, they decided that they were going to kill him. Now, I don't know how they justified that because the Bible says thou shalt not murder, right? But they justified that they were going to kill Jesus Christ. So Jesus has his last supper with the disciples. He asks them to remember him, to remember his life, to remember everything that they've been through. One of his chosen friends takes a piece of bread from Jesus that he offered him and goes to the high priests and the religious leaders and says, I know where Jesus is going to be later on. Give me my money. 30 pieces of silver. That was the price of a slave. Jesus Christ was sold out for the price of a slave. Jesus, after dinner, washes his disciples' feet, gives them a, a example of being a servant. We're to be servants of the living God. I can't think of anything more Hi. I know that's not good English. I can't think of anything higher than to be called a servant of the living God. Wow. That's amazing. After dinner, after washing the disciples' feet, they went over to the Mount of Olives, the Garden of Gethsemane, across the Kidron Valley there from the temple. The next day, the high priest would be offering the sacrificial lamb at the temple for the sins of the nation. And they went there and Jesus Christ broke down. He broke down. He knew it was close. It was within hours now that he was going to be put on a cross. And he asked his disciples, he says, just stay with me. Just, just stay with me. Just support me in some way. And you know what they did? They fell asleep, didn't they? Wow. Wonder how many Christians are asleep today. He went about a stone's throw away from his disciples and he, he knelt down and I'm sure he was prostrate to the ground. It said that he was so, Jesus himself said he was so stressed out, he was to the point of dying. He was so stressed out that drops of blood came out of his, the pores of his flesh, and he started to look like someone that was a mess. He said to his father, he says, Father, if there's any way that this cup can pass from me, let it be so, but nevertheless, your will be done. I don't want anything less than your will to be done. 
He got up and went to his disciples and he says, couldn't you just stay awake with me for a little while? If you've ever been lonely, you can go to Jesus Christ because he knows what it's like to be alone. He was very alone through his life. He went back and prayed again, same prayer. Lord, if there's a way that this can pass from me, let's do it. But he said, I don't want anything other than your will to be done. And after that, his buddy, Judas, came and with the Romans and with the high priests and gave Jesus a kiss on his cheek and betrayed him to the... You see, Jesus was not... He did not look like Fabio, okay? He didn't have the long, blonde hair and the blue eyes and, and just, you know, the gorgeous cheekbones and all the rest of this stuff. Jesus Christ was a Jewish man. Probably somewhere around 5'5", five, 5'6", five, five, at the most probably 5'8". Dark hair, probably dark eyes, maybe even dark skin. He looked like an ordinary guy. And the religious leaders and the, um, the Roman officials came and arrested him. The first place they took him was the house of Caiaphas. He was the high priest. He was the mucky muck of all religious leaders, right? And you know what they did with him? They blindfolded Jesus Christ, slapped him across the face, beat him with a stick, pulled his <coughs> beard, and said, Hey, Son of God, prophesy who hit you. Tell us who hit you. <coughs> he went through six unlawful trials. Trials, Unlawful from the Jewish perspective and unlawful actually from the Roman perspective too. Finally, they take him to the high Roman officials. High Roman officials, they, they, they question him and say, I can't find anything wrong with him. But the crowd was influenced by the religious leaders. He brings out, Pontius Pilate brings out this criminal, this murderer named Barabbas. Bar meaning son of. Abba meaning father. Barabbas was the son of the father. Just as Jesus Christ is the son of the father. And they chose the murderer to be released and Jesus Christ to be crucified. Pilate washed his hands and says, I, you know, okay, this is your decision. Take him away. And what they did is they took Jesus Christ to the Praetorium, which was where the guards all lived. And they had, in that Praetorium, they had a, a center, like a courtyard, and they had in the middle of the courtyard, they had this post that was set in the ground, and Jesus Christ was tied or chained to the post. And part of the punishment for being crucified was to be scourged, to be beaten. And what they did is they beat Jesus Christ. They beat him and they beat him and they beat him until they bloodied him up so bad he was unrecognizable. Let me read something for, from Isaiah to you. You don't have to turn there. It's Isaiah 52 and Isaiah 53. And it, it tells us exactly. See, I wonder. I wonder when all this is happening. What is Jesus thinking? My best guess is that he's going back to the Old Testament. And he's thinking about the prophecies that he's fulfilling. Here's what it says. It says, just, he says, uh, see my servant. This is a. Uh, Isaiah 52, 13. Listen. See my servant, speaking of Jesus, will act wisely. He will be raised up and lifted up and highly exalted. Just as there were many who were appalled at him, his appearance was so disfigured beyond that of any man and his form marred beyond human likeness. 
Now, if you've ever seen The Passion of the Christ that was produced by Mel Gibson, he really, he really got that pretty, pretty right. When Jesus came out of that scourging and the whip that they used to scourge him had, it, it, it was a, had a handle and it had several thong leather strips on it. And at the end of the leather strips there was metal, glass, rock, sharp rock. And what would happen is when you whipped somebody with that, it dug into your skin and as soon as you pulled the whip back, it peeled your skin like you used to do with an old can. Remember that? Thirty-nine times they hit him. Forty was legal. It was legal to, to, to scourge a person forty times. But... If you went past 40, you accidentally miscounted, it was a real problem in the Roman law. So they always did it 39 times to make sure that they didn't go past 40. 39 times Jesus Christ's back, his legs, his shoulders, back of his neck, just stripped of skin. Totally, completely stripped of skin. After that was over, they dressed him in a robe, Put a crown, shoved a crown of thorns on his head. You know how easily head wounds bleed. And made him walk and carry the cross beam of his cross up to the hill called Golgotha, where they nailed him to that cross, set him up above the ground. Romans had not invented persecution. The Persians did that. But they sure did perfect it. They would have people crucified along the main entrance to go into the city so that if you thought about committing a crime against Rome, you'd think twice because of all these people who were crucified. Many, many people. Jesus Christ was crucified on the cross. He was arrested, beaten, traded for a criminal humiliated. They put him on the cross at 9 o'clock in the morning. And on the cross he he said, Lord, Father, forgive these people for their sins. They don't know what they're doing. He had the two thieves that were dissing on him saying, well, if you're the Son of God, man, why don't you save yourself and save us? One of the thieves, after hearing Jesus say, Forgive them, Father, thought to himself, this isn't normal. And he said, Lord, when you come into your kingdom, will you remember me? And Jesus said, today you will be with me in paradise. You see, salvation was hard for God, but it's pretty easy for us. How does a person become saved? They receive Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior into their life, into their heart. They ask God to forgive them for their sins. And in effect, because Jesus Christ bought each one of us with a very expensive price, God says, give yourself to me. Just give yourself to me. I'll take you all, lock, stock, and barrel, problems and everything. Nine o'clock, Jesus is on the cross. <laughs> He even made provision for his mother. Ask his disciple John, who was the only disciple there, by the way, to watch out after his mother for him. He was naked. <clears throat> At 12 o'clock noon, darkness came over the whole entire land. A darkness so thick that you couldn't see your hand in front of your face. And Jesus Christ started screaming, my God speaking to the Father. My God speaking to the Holy Spirit. Why have you left me? Why have you forsaken me? You see, God could not look on Jesus Christ because God was imputing your sins and my sins to Him. It took God three hours to judge all of the sins of every single person that would ever live on the face of the earth. Did you know that every single person on the face of the earth has the potential of having their sins forgiven. Yes. 
All they have to do is say, Lord, please forgive me for my sins. What a blessing. What an amazing blessing. Three hours it took God in total darkness. When God was finished judging the sins of the world on Jesus Christ, Jesus Christ said, it is finished. In the Greek, that basically means the debt is paid. The debt is paid. Into your hands, Father, I commit my spirit. See, Jesus Christ was not murdered, even though we look at it that way. Jesus Christ gave his life. He could have called a legion of powerful angels, and he could have, he could have done away with all of it. And he decided to go to the cross for you and me. He would have gone and done all that if you were the only one to have ever have accepted him as Savior. That's amazing. In Isaiah 53, listen, I'm just going to read this beautiful scripture. I want you to think about this from the point of Jesus Christ. Maybe Jesus was thinking about this as he was suffering. It says, Who has believed our message? And to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? He, speaking about Jesus, grew up before him, speaking about God, like a tender shoot and like a root out of dry ground. He had no beauty or majesty to attract us to him. No Fabio. Nothing in his appearance that we should desire him. He had to be pointed out by Judas as the Savior, as the one, as Jesus, because all of them looked like ordinary men. He says he was despised and rejected by men, a man of sorrows and familiar with suffering, like one from whom men hide their face. He was despised and we esteemed him not, Surely he took up our infirmities and carried our sorrows, yet we considered him stricken by God, smitten by him and afflicted. But he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was upon him. And by his wounds we are healed. We all, like sheep, have gone astray. Each one of us has turned to his own way. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed and afflicted, yet he did not open his mouth. He was led like a lamb to the slaughter, as a sheep before her shears is silent, so he did not open his mouth. By oppression and judgment he was taken away. And who can speak of his descendants? Jesus Christ. He gave himself. He didn't get to be married and have kids and, and live a normal life. He ministered for 33 years. And guess what? He's still ministering today. Did you know that? He's still ministering. He has ministry. You know what his ministry is? When you pray to him, he interprets that prayer to the Lord, to the Father, and God says, okay, I can answer that prayer. The Bible in John says, if we pray according to His will, He will not only hear our prayers, but He'll answer them. Lord, I'd sure like to win the lottery. I don't think that that's a prayer that, uh, you know, God may look at that and just Jesus would interpret that and say, Father, sorry about that. Um, what he really is saying is, could you provide enough to pay the bills? Okay, I can do that. Look at God's track record in your life. Has God ever failed you? Can you point a finger at God and say, God, you screwed up. You failed me. It's all us, isn't it? 999999 percent of all my problems were caused by me. Isn't that true? Can I hear an amen? amen. Thank you. 
We'll be finished here in a minute, okay? Now listen to this. He was cut off from the land of the living for the transgression of my people. He was stricken. We're going to get some good news here in a minute. He was assigned a grave with the wicked and with the rich in his death, though he had done no violence, nor was there any deceit found in his mouth. Yet, it was the Lord's will to crush him. That's what it says. And though the Lord makes his life a guilt offering, he will see his offspring. Guess whose offspring is? You and me. Yeah. Jesus is going to see his offspring. The Bible says that we are his brothers. The Bible says he's not ashamed to call us brothers. We're God's children. If you know God, if you've received God into your heart, you are God's child. If you have not received God into your heart, I'm going to give you a chance to do that today. Okay? Listen. It says, And the will of the Lord will prosper in his hand. After the suffering of his soul, he will see the light of life and be satisfied. By his knowledge, my righteous servant will justify many. And he will bear their iniquities. Therefore, I will give him a great portion among the great. And he will divide the spoils with the strong, because he poured out his life unto death and was numbered with the transgression. For he bore the sins of many and made intercession for the transgressors. Wow. Death couldn't hold Jesus. Couldn't hold him. Nope. You bet. Paul says that if it wasn't for the resurrection, Christianity would be kind of just a good life. That's it. I don't know about you, but I'd probably rather party hardy, you know, than just work at always trying to be a godly person. Well, at three o'clock in the afternoon, when Jesus died, says there was a great earthquake. Darkness covered the land. In fact, it says that there were souls that came out of the graves and walked around the city of Jerusalem. It says that the, t the veil that was in the temple was torn in two. This was no little sheet. This was like a foot or so thick, weaved together. It was the separation of the normal man from God. The only one that was allowed to go in there once a year was the high priest. And the veil was torn. The veil was his body. His body was torn for you and me. And you know what? The only thing that separates us from God today is Jesus Christ. Do you know God in your heart today? If you don't, you can. Will you bow your heads? Close your eyes? If there's anybody in here, and I'm not going to embarrass you, but if there's anybody in here that's never accepted Jesus Christ as their Savior, will you quickly just raise your hand? If you've never accepted Jesus Christ as your Savior. Okay, I see that hand. Okay. Anybody else? Okay, you just put your hand down. If there's anybody in this room that would like to rededicate their lives to Jesus Christ, would you quickly just raise your hand and put it down? Okay, I see those hands. Yes. Please pray with me. Dear Father in heaven, Dear Father in heaven please, forgive please forgive me for my sins. Please cleanse me from all unrighteousness. I believe in Jesus Christ as my Savior. Come into my heart and my life. Make me a new person. In Jesus' name. Amen. Hey, thanks for sticking with me. We went out a little over. Uh, I'm going to blame the kids. Okay. <laughs>
why not, you know. <laughs> John, you got something you want to... Oh, oh, yeah. Pastor PK is going to... Pastor PK is going to bring us a song.